Launching in April 1989 in Japan, Nintendo's Game Boy took the world by storm and literally changed the game in the process, selling an incredible 60 million units in the span of just eight years. And how could you resist Pokemon Red and Blue, Tetris, Super Mario World? If there was a better way to spend long commutes or car journeys in the 90s, I want to hear it. Playing big, angular cartridges, requiring four AA batteries and boasting a 2.6-inch four-shade LCD screen as well as stereo sound through headphones, the Game Boy left an indelible mark on popular culture. Look, here's one very old and one recently deceased superhero enjoying a game. I've been waiting to make this video too, as you might be able to tell, I am a big fan of the original Game Boy. Just don't ask me about my Game Boy Color collection, or do. I have a feeling we will get to that in due course. But for now, we'll be hopping back to April 1989, August 1989, and September 1990 to cover the games of the Japanese, US, and European Game Boy launch lineups. No Metacritic for these guys, though, so I'll be sourcing reviews from elsewhere. Are you ready? Then let's do this. <laughs> A breakout clone where you move a paddle horizontally to bounce a ball at tiles and try not to let it fall into the pit below, Alleyway was a fixture of the Game Boy's launch lineup in all three regions. How's Nintendo gonna sell us on this one though? Ah, there's Mario. For as much as it definitely copies Breakout, a game that released over a decade prior, mind, there's still something inherently enjoyable about bouncing a big ball at some stupid tiles, especially when you manage to get it on top of the stack and it does lots of bounces, making fun noises and releasing endorphins into your brain space. Oh yeah, that's the stuff. Apparently, the ball will only travel at 15, 30, or 45 degree angles, and while it's impossible to get it stuck in an endless ricochet loop, there was more than one occasion where it felt like it would never stop bouncing off the corner. There's only a handful of unique level designs, but when they start to repeat, they do introduce new gameplay features like bad ceiling, fast tiles, and tiny paddle, because screw you, that's why. There are occasional bonus stages like this one, presumably designed by Sega where you make Mario evaporate, but Alleyway didn't actually have a continue feature. As in, when you shut down the Game Boy, it would forget all your progress, so you had to complete it in one sitting if you wanted to be the best at smashing them tiles. 48.25% according to the average of reviews listed on Wikipedia, with reviewers citing repetitiveness and a lack of originality. Oh, off he goes. Oh yeah, here we go, sports time! I've never played a baseball game before. Hell, I've never watched baseball either, but I'm going to give this everything I've got. And what do you know, it's Mario and Luigi heading up the teams. Wouldn't want us to buy a baseball game on its own merits, eh Nintendo? I'm batting first, and I can't think of a legendary Nintendo mascot more deserving of being first onto the field. Go get the mic! Good lord, Luigi is absolutely ruthless. He's only gone and taken out Mike and Tom. I then paused the game and now I'm subbing in Fred for some reason. Uh, oh, uh, never mind. Time to throw some balls instead! Right, just throw it straight and true, directly down the middle, and... Ah, oh, for God's sake! The controls are all a bit rubbish and wonky, with the AI knowing exactly what it's doing, continuously making contact with my pitches and working through their batters at such a rate that even Brian got a go. Brian, come on! Perhaps most frustrating is that they kept hitting the ball in exactly the same direction and my catchy boys refused to learn from their mistakes. Eventually I did catch out Luigi though, that smug bastard, but as with a lot of this first wave of Game Boy titles, teething problems were abundant and to be expected. How was I supposed to know when you already had a player on a base that you had to press a button to make him run so your other player doesn't get killed? Or eliminated? 
or whatever the baseball terminology is. IGN gave it 50%, stating, The game's controls are serviceable, and it's still satisfying to send a home run sailing over the outfield wall, so baseball isn't a bad game, just kind of a boring one. God, alright, let's see how Nintendo try to cram Mario into this one. What are they like, honestly? It's a Nintendo device launch, so of course we've got to have a bit of real Mario in here. No, not you, Alleyway Mario. Oh man, just listen to that beautiful music. In fact, I'll be generous. Here's 10 uninterrupted seconds. You're welcome. Set in the rarely revisited Sarasaland and including worlds based on real locations like ancient Egypt, this side-scrolling platformer is not only the first Mario game of this kind to be released for a handheld console, but it's also the first of the plumber's games to not have Shigeru Miyamoto involved. And I'd say they did a bang-up job, all things considered. Goombas, coins, Shelly boys, infuriating Sphinx bosses, it's all here. Admittedly, it's a little weird hearing the non-contemporary invincibility power-up music, but I'll forgive it. The deafening bonus levels are a little overwhelming, and the hit detection can prove annoying, but the importance of Super Mario Land's contribution to both the Game Boy and future Mario games cannot be understated, going so far as to introduce players to Princess Daisy for the very first time selling over 18 million copies and registering a staggering 90.5% review average according to the reviews listed on Wikipedia, the title introduced the Game Boy in style, and even brought us a familiar looking mode of Mario Transport some 28 years before we'd see it again. May maybe. Oh yeah, here we go, sports time! I've played a tennis game before, and I've also... Oh no, Mario, you get out! You get out of here! Music, yes! Not so much an option as a declaration of excitement, eh, tennis for the Game Boy? Practically a remake of NES tennis and a launch title unique to the US, tennis is a predictably simple affair. You take it in turns serving and receiving with the aim of not losing. A revelation, I know. Problem is, I found it really rather difficult, seemingly losing most of my points, not to superior play from my opposition, but to swinging my racket without making contact with the ball, and also 99% of my returns being declared out by this overbearing, mustachioed idiot, wind your neck in Mario, please! It is possible to lob, but without a real sense of positioning or shot power, the subtleties and pixel-perfect requirements of volleys are a real challenge to pull off. While it may feel logical to send your foe right before returning the ball to the left, it almost always ends up going out anyway. Similar to a few of these launch games, two Game Boy owners can get annoyed together via link cable. So. There's that. Eventually I managed to get into a decent rhythm of successful aces exclusively when serving to the left for some reason, and pulled it back to win one single solitary set. Take that, you smug beige man, and you can piss off too, Mario, in your big high chair. Nintendo Life gave it 60% and said of the 3DS re-release, there's not really that much to do, but for $3 you're getting an enjoyable, fun little game. Ah, here it is. Play me that iconic music. The real iconic music. No, the other real iconic music. Perfection. Everyone's played Tetris at some point. A apart from me. I know, it's shocking. Revoke my gamer license and throw me in video game prison, but I've never actually sat down and played Tetris before, not properly anyway, but it just makes sense, doesn't it? Guide your tetrominoes down the screen, rotating so they fit together as best they can. Complete a line, and that line disappears, earning points, but don't let the screen fill up to the top. Fun for the whole family. Created by Alexei Pajitnov in the Soviet Union in 1984, the story of how Tetris made it to Nintendo's first handheld is fascinating, complicated, and legally messy. I won't recount the whole thing here, but highlights include a trip to the Soviet Union by a Nintendo representative just two months before the Game Boy released in Japan to secure the rights. Accusations of illegal publication, suspected breaches of contract, cease and desists, and apparently then-Soviet leader Mikhail Gorbachev was even briefly involved. 
It's absolutely bonkers and well worth looking up. Anyway, you can also play a challenge mode where you start with a screen full of wonkily placed blocks and have to work around them, which honestly looks like a normal game for me. An additional fun challenge is seeing just how fast you can get a game over. Let's watch. Get on my level, scrubs! Credited as the Game Boy's killer app and selling 35 million copies, this version of Tetris was Paget Nov's favourite, and although it scored 65% from Famitsu at the time, Tetris has since garnered scores of 80 and 90% from Nintendo Life and IGN, respectively. Got a level with you on this one, guys. I don't speak Japanese. Yakuman was a Japan-exclusive launch title for the Game Boy, and as such, was entirely comprised of Japanese. It's also a Mahjong game. Have you ever played Mahjong? Because I bloody haven't. So, I begin my Mahjong adventure by picking the tiles that look most interesting to me, before just selecting them as they're revealed. To my surprise, I won, I think? There's a number there now, anyway, unless it's a golf situation where lowest score wins or something, but I'm choosing to believe I won. Picking more fun-looking tiles, I won again? Maybe. This can't be right. I then picked every tile sequentially, and uh, the game finished early and my score was taken away. I also lost some numbers, and oh, I see, my opponent is now 4-0 up, so that... Uh, I probably wasn't winning then. I've looked up the rules on Wikipedia and still don't understand, but hey, Mahjong on the go? That's got to appeal to someone, probably. Also, I've hunted around for a Yakuman numerically scored review, but try as I might, I simply can't find any. It was a niche game aimed at Japanese adults, so that might not be hugely surprising, but I apologise nonetheless. Fun fact though, the prominently featured Yakuman player on the box was available as a sticker in Super Smash Bros Brawl, and a spirit in Super Smash Bros Ultimate. So there you are. And there you have it, every single Game Boy launch game reviewed, sort of, in 2020. Were there any in there that were your favourite? Please let me know in the comments below. And why not follow me on Twitter for news of future launch game lineup videos? I hear you loud and clear about the PS1 and PS2. Just don't want to get to the, the exciting part too early. You know, this series is young, but we will get there. I promise. Thank you so much for watching. Look after yourselves, and I'll see you next time. Bye!